everybody. This is Allison from Alley Cat Creations. How are you? I'm hanging in. A very snowy, windy Saturday. Carlos Castaneda. We're almost done. I'm a little sad because I really like this book, but that just leaves more room for more books to read. We're going to get started in the jump into the abyss. We'll see what that means. There was only one trail leading to the flat mesa. Once we were on the mesa itself, I realized that it was not an extensive as it had appeared when I had looked at it from a distance. The vegetation on the mesa was not different from the vegetation below. Faded green, woody shrubs that had the ambiguous appearance of trees. At first, I didn't see the chasm. It was only when Don Juan led me to it that I became aware that the mesa ended in a precipice. It wasn't really a mesa, but merely the flat top of a good sized mountain. The mountain was round and eroded on its east and south faces. However, on part of its west and north sides, it seemed to have been cut with a knife. From the edge of the precipice, I was able to see the bottom of the ravine, perhaps 600 feet below. It was covered with the same woody shrubs that grew everywhere. A whole row of small mountains to the south and to the north of the mountaintop gave the clear impression that they had been part of gigantic canyon millions of years old, dug out by no longer existing river. The edges of the canyon had been erased by erosion. At certain points, they had been leveled with the ground. The only portion still intact was the area where I was standing. It's solid rock, Don Juan said, as if he were reading my thoughts. My pointed, he pointed with his chin toward the bottom of the ravine. If anything were to fall down from this edge to the bottom, it would get smashed to flakes on the rock down there. This was the initial dialogue between Don Juan and myself that day on the mountaintop. Prior to going there, he had told me that his time on earth had come to an end. He was leaving on his definitive journey. His statements were devastating to me. I truly lost my grip and entered into a blissful state of fragmentation, perhaps similar to what people experience when they have a mental breakdown. But there was a core fragment of myself that remained cohesive that me of my childhood. The rest was vagueness, inter, inter, insert, incertitude. I had been fragmented for so long that to become fragmented once again was the only way out of my devastation. A most particular interplay became between different levels of my awareness took place afterward. Don Juan, his cohort, Don Gennaro, two of his apprentices, Pablito and Nestor, and I had climbed to that mountaintop. Pablito and Nestor and I were there to take care of our last task as apprentices to jump into the abyss. A most mysterious affair, which Don Juan had explained to me at various levels of awareness, but which has remained an enigma to me to this day. Don Juan jokingly said that I should get my writing pad and start taking notes about our last moments together. He gently poked me in the ribs and assured me as he had hid his laughter that it would be, that would have been only proper since I started on the warrior's traveler's path by taking notes. Don Juanero caught in and said that other warrior travelers before us had stood on the same flat mountaintop before embarking on their journey to the unknown. Don Juan turned to me and in a soft voice said that soon I would be entering into affinity by the force of my personal power 
and that he and Don Juanero were there only to bid me farewell. Don Juanero caught in again and said that I was there also to do the same for them. Once you have entered into affinity, Don Juan said, you can't depend on us to bring you back. Your decision is need, needed then. Only you can decide whether or not to return. I must also warn you that few warrior travelers survive this type of encounter with infinity. Infinity is enticing beyond belief. A warrior traveler finds that to return to the world of disorder, compulsion, noise, and pain is a most unappealing affair. You must know that your decision to stay or to return is not a matter of a reasonable choice, but a matter of intending it. If you choose not to return, he continued, you'll disappear as if the earth had swallowed you. But if you choose to come back, you must tighten your belt and wait like a true warrior traveler until your task, whatever it might be, is finished, either in success or in defeat. A very subtle change began to take place in my awareness then. I started to remember faces of people, but I wasn't sure I had met them. Strange feelings of anguish and aff affection started to mount. Don Juan's voice was no longer audible. I longed for people I sincerely doubted I ever met. I was suddenly possessed by the most unbearable love for those persons, whoever they may have been. My feelings for them were beyond words, and yet I couldn't tell who they were. I only sensed their presence, as if I had lived another life before, or as if I were feeling for people in a dream. I sensed that their outside form shifted. They began by being tall and ended up petite. Whatever was left intact was their essence, the very thing that produced my unbearable longing for them. Don Juan came to my side and said to me, the agreement was that you remain in the awareness of the daily world. His voice was harsh and authoritative. Today, you're going to fulfill a concrete task, he went on the last link of a long chain, and you must do it in your utmost mood of reason. I had never heard Don Juan talk to me in that tone of voice. He was a different man at, the, at that instant, yet was thoroughly familiar to me. I meekly obeyed him and went back to the awareness of the world of everyday life. I didn't know what I was doing this, however. To me, it appeared on that day as if I had acquiesced to Don Juan out of fear and respect. Don Juan spoke to me next in the tone I was accustomed to. What he said was very familiar. He said that the backbone of a warrior traveler's humbleness and efficiency, acting without expecting anything and withstanding anything that lies ahead of him. I went at that point through another shift in my level of awareness. My mind focused on a thought or a feeling of anguish. I knew then that I had made a pact with some people to die with them, and I couldn't remember who they were. I felt without the shadow of a doubt that it was wrong that I should die alone. My anguish became unbearable. Don Juan spoke to me. We are alone, he said. That's our condition. But to die alone is not to die in loneliness. It took big gulps of air to ease my tension. As I breathed deeply, my mind became clear. The great issue with us males is our family, or fr fr frailty, he went on. When our awareness begins to grow, it grows like a column, right on the midpoint of a luminous being from the ground up. That column has to reach a considerable height before we can rely on it. At this time in your life, as a sorcerer, you easily lose your grip on your new awareness. When you do that, you forget everything you have done and seen on the warrior traveler's path because your consciousness shifts back to the awareness of your everyday life. I have explained to you that the task of every male sorcerer is to reclaim everything he has done and seen on warrior traveler's path while he was on new levels of awareness. The problem of every male sorcerer is that he easily forgets because his awareness loses its new level and fails to ground at the, sh at the drop of a hat. I understand exactly what you're saying, Don Juan, I said. 
Perhaps this is the first time I had come to full realization of why I forget everything and why I remember everything later. I have always believed that my shifts were due to a personal pathological condition. I know now why these changes take place, yet I can't verbalize what I know. Don't worry about verbalizations, Don Juan said. You verbalize all you want in due time. Today, you must act on your inner silence, on what you know without knowing. You know to perfection what you have to do, but this knowledge is not quite formulated in your thoughts yet. On the level of concrete thoughts or sensations, all I have, all I've had, were vague feelings of knowing something that was not part of my mind. I had then the clearest sense of having taken a huge step down. Something seemed to have dropped inside of me. It was almost a jolt. I knew that I had entered into another level of awareness at that instant. Don Juan told me that it is obl obligatory that a warrior travel say goodbye to all the peoples he leaves behind. He must say goodbye in a loud and clear voice so that his shout and his feelings will remain forever recorded in those mountains. I hesitated for a long time, not out of bashfulness, but because I didn't know whom to include in my thanks. I had completely internalized the sorcerer's concept that warrior travelers can't owe any, anything to anyone. Don Juan had drilled a sorcerer's axiom into me, warrior travelers play pay elegantly, generously, and with unequal ease every favor, every service rendered to them. In this manner, they get rid of the burden of being indebted. I had paid, or I was in the process of paying everyone who had honored me with their care or concern. I had recapitulated my life to such an extent that I had not left a single stone unturned. I truthfully believe in those days that I didn't owe anything to anyone. I expressed my beliefs and hesitation to Don Juan. Don Juan said that I indeed recapitulated my life thoroughly, but he added that I was far from being free of indebtedness. How about your ghosts, he went on. Those can, you can no longer touch. He knew what he was talking about. During my recapitulation, I had re recounted to him every incident of my life. Out of the hundreds of incidents that I related to him, he had isolated three as samples of indebtedness that I incurred every, very early in life and had added to that my indebtedness to the person who was instrumental in my meeting him. I had thanked my friend profusely and I had sensations that something out there acknowledged my thanks. The other three had remained stories from my life, stories of people who had given me an inconceivable gift in whom I had never thanked. One of these stories had to do with a man I've known when I was a child. His name was Leonar Mr. Leonardo Acosta. He was my grandfather's arch enemy, his true nemesis. My grandfather had accused this man repeatedly of stealing chickens from his chicken farm. The man wasn't, wasn't a vibrant, but someone who didn't have a steady, definite job. He was a maverick of sorts, a gambler, a master of many trades, handyman, self-styled curer, hunter, and provider of plant and insect specimens for both local herbalists and curers, and any kind of bird or mammal life for taxidermists or pet shops. People believe that he made tons of money, but that he couldn't keep it or invest it. His detractors and friends alike believe that he could have established the most prosperous business in the area, doing what he knew how to do best, searching for plants and hunting animals but that he was cursed with the strange disease of the spirit that made him restless, incapable of tending to anything for any length of time. One day while I was taking a stroll on the edge of my grandfather's farm, I noticed that someone was watching me from between the thick bushes at the forest edge. It was Mr. Acosta. 
He was squatting inside the bushes of the jungle itself and would have been totally out of sight had it not been for my sharp eight-year-old eyes. I wonder why my, grandma, my grandfather thinks that he comes to steal chickens, I thought. I believe that no one else could, no one else but me could have noticed him. He was utterly concealed by his motionlessness. I had caught the difference between the bushes and his silhouette by feeling rather than sight. I approached him. The fact that people reject him so viciously or liked him so passionately intrigued me to no end. What are you doing there, Mr. Acosta? I asked daringly. I'm taking a shit. <laughs> While I look at your grandfather's farm, he said, you better, so you better scram before I get up unless you like the smell of Ew! <laughs> I moved away a short distance. I wanted to know if he was really doing what he was claiming. He was, he got up. I thought he was going to leave the bush and come out into my grandfather's land and perhaps walk across the road, but he didn't. He began to walk up inward into the jungle. Hey, Mr. Acosta, I yelled, can I come with you? I noticed that he had stopped walking. It was again, more a feeling than an actual sight because the bush was so thick. You can certainly come with me if you can find an entry into the bush, he said. That wasn't difficult for me in my hours of idleness. I had marked an entry into the bush with a good sized rock. I had found out through an endless process of trial and error that there was a crawling space there, which if I found for three or four yards turned into an actual trail on which I could stand up and walk. Mr. Acosta came to me and said, bravo kid, you done it. Yes, come with me if you want to. That was the beginning of my association with Mr. Leonardo Acosta. We went on daily hunting expeditions. Our association became so obvious since I was gone from the house from dawn to sunset without anybody know, ever knowing where I went. That finally, my grandfather admonished me severely. You must select your acquaintances, he said, or you will end up being like them. I will not tolerate this man affecting you in any way imaginable. He could certainly transmit to you his Elan, yes. And he could influence your mind to be just like his, useless. I'm telling you, if you don't put an end to this, I will. I'll send the authorities after him on charges of stealing my chickens because you know damn well that he comes every day and steals them. I tried to show my grandfather the absurdity of his charges. Mr. Acosta didn't have to steal chickens. He had the vastness of the jungle at his command. He could have drawn from that jungle anything he wanted, but my arguments infiltrated, infuriated my grandfather even more. I realized then that my grandfather secretly envied Mr. Acosta's freedom and Mr. Acosta was transformed for me by this realization from a nice hunter into the ultimate expression of what it is at the time, both forbidden and desired. I attempted to curtail my encounters with Mr. Acosta, but the lore was just too overwhelming for me. Then one day, Mr. Acosta and three of his friends proposed that I do something that Mr. Acosta had never done before, catch a vulture alive, uninjured. He explained to me that the vulture of the area, which were enormous, were a five to six foot wingspan had seven different types of flesh in their bodies, and each one of those seven types served a specific curative purpose. He said that the desired state was that the vulture's body not to be injured. The vulture had to be killed by tranquilizer, not by violence. It was easy to shoot them, but in the case, the meat lost its curative value. So the art was to catch them alive, a thing that he had never done. He had figured out though, that with my help and the help of the three friends, he had the problem licked. He assured me that his was a natural conclusion arrived at after hundreds of occasions on which he had observed the behaviors of vultures. 
We need to deal a dead donkey in order to perform this feat, something which we have, he declared eluberantly. He looked at me, waiting for me to ask the question of what would be done with the dead donkey. Since the question was not asked, he proceeded. We removed the intestines and we put some sticks in there to keep the roundness of the belly. The leader of the turkey vultures is the king. He is the biggest, the most intelligent, he went on. No sharper eyes exist. That's what makes him a king. He'll be the one who will spot the dead donkey and the first who will land on it. He'll land downwind from the donkey to really smell that it is dead. The intestines and soft organs that we are going to draw out of the donkey's belly will pile by his rear end outside. This way, it looks like a wild cat had already eaten some of it. Then lazily, the vulture will come closer to the donkey. He'll take his time. He'll come hopping, flying, and then he'll land on the dead donkey's hip and begin to rock the donkey's body. He would turn it over if it were not for the four sticks that we have staked into the ground as part of the arm armature. He stood on the hip for a while. That will be the clue for another vulture to come and land there in the vicinity. Only when he has three or four of his companions down with him will the king vulture begin his work. And what is my role in all this, Mr. Acosta, I asked. You hide inside the donkey. He said with a deadpan expression, nothing to it. I give you a pair of especially designed leather gloves and you sit there and wait until the king vulture rips the anus of the dead donkey open with the enormous powerful beak and stick his head in to begin eating. Then you grab him by the neck with both hands, don't let go. My three friends and I will be hiding on a horseback in a deep ravine. I'll be watching the operation with binoculars. When I see that you have grabbed the king vulture by the neck, we'll come at full gallop and throw ourselves on top of the vulture and subdue him. Can you subdue the vulture, Mr. Acosta? I asked him. Not that I doubt his skill. I just wanted to be assured. Of course I can, he said with all the confidence in the world. We're going to be wearing gloves and leather leggings. The vulture's talons are quite powerful. They could break a shin bone like a twig. There was no way out for me. I was caught, nailed by an exorbitant ex ex excitation. My admiration for Mr. Len Leonardo Acosta knew no limits at the moment. I saw him as a true hunter resourceful, cunning, and knowledgeable. Okay, let's do it then, I said. That's my boy, Mr. Acosta. I ex accepted as much from you. He had put on thick blanket behind his saddle and one of his friends just lifted me up and put me on Mr. Acosta's horse, right behind the saddle sitting on the blanket. Hold on to the saddle, Mr. Acosta said, and as you hold on to the saddle, hold on, Hold the blanket too. We took off at a leisurely trot. We rode for perhaps an hour until we came to a flat, dry, desolate land. We stopped by a tent that resembled a vendor's stand in a market. It had a flat roof for shade. Underneath the roof was a dead brown donkey. It didn't seem that old. It looked like an adolescent donkey. Neither Mr. Acosta nor his friends explained to me whether they had found or killed the dead donkey. I waited for them to tell me, but I wasn't going to ask. While they made the preparations, Mr. Acosta explained that the tent was in place because vultures were on the lookout from high distances out there, circling very high out of sight, certainly capable of seeing everything that was going on. Those creatures are creatures of sight alone, Mr. Acosta said. They have miserable ears and their noses are not as good as their eyes. We have to plug every hole of the carcass. I don't want you to, pe want you to be peeking out of any hole because 
they will see your eyes and never come down. They must see nothing. They put some sticks inside the donkey's belly and I crossed them, leaving enough room for me to crawl in. At one moment, I finally ventured the question that I was dying to ask. Tell me, Mr. Acosta, the donkey surely died of an illness, didn't he? Do you think a disease could affect me? Mr. Acosta raised his eyes to the sky. Come on, you cannot be that dumb. Donkey's diseases cannot be transmitted to men. Let's live this adventure and not worry about stupid details. If I were shorter, I'd be inside that donkey's belly myself. Do you know what it is to catch the king of turkey buzzards? I believe him. His words were sufficient to set up a cloak of unequaled confidences over me. I wasn't going to get sick and miss every event of events. The dreaded moment came when Mr. Acosta put me inside the donkey. Then they stretched the skin over the amateur and began to sew it closed. They left nevertheless a large area open at the bottom against the ground for air to circulate in. The horrendous moment for me came when the skin was finally closed over my head like a lid of a coffin. I breathed hard thinking only about the excitement of grabbing the king of vultures by the neck. Mr. Acosta gave me last minute instructions. He said it would be, it would let me know by a whistle that resembled a bird call when the king vulture was flying around and when it had landed so as to keep me informed and prevent me from fretting or getting impatient. Then I heard them calling down their tent, followed by their horses galloping away. It was a good thing that they hadn't left a single space open to walk out from, because that's what I would have done. The temptation to look up and see what was going on was nearly irresistible. A long time went by in which I didn't think of anything. Then I heard Mr. Acosta's whistling and I presumed the king vulture was circling around. My presumption turned to certainty when I heard the flapping of most powerful wings. And then suddenly the dead donkey's body began to rock as if it were in a windstorm. Then I felt a weight of the donkey's body and I knew that the king vulture had landed on the donkey and it was not moving anymore. I heard the flapping of wings and the whistling of Mr. Acosta in the distance. Then I braced myself for the inevitable. The body of the donkey began to shake as something started to rip the skin. Suddenly, a huge ugly head with a red crest, an enormous beak and piercing open eye bursted in. I yelled with fright and grabbed the neck with both hands. I think I stunned the king vulture for an instant because he didn't do anything, which gave me the opportunity to grab the neck even harder. And then all hell broke loose. He ceased to be stunned and began to pull with such a force that I was smashed against the structure. And in the in next instant, I was partially out of the donkey's body, amateur and all, all holding onto the neck of the invading beast for dear life. I heard Mr. Acosta gall galloping horse in the distance. I heard him yelling, let's go boys, let's go. He's going to fly away with you. The king vulture indeed was going to either fly away with me, holding onto his neck or rip me apart with the force of his talons. The reason he couldn't reach me was because his head was stuck halfway into the viscera and the amateur. His talons kept slipping on the loose intestines and they never actually touched me. Another thing that saved me was the force of the vulture was pulling in, involved in pulling his neck out from the clasp and he could not move his talons far forward enough to really injure me. The next thing I knew, Mr. Acosta had landed on top of the vulture at the pre precise moment that my leather gloves came off my hands. Mr. Acosta was behind himself with joy. We've done it, my boy, we've done it, he said. The next time we'll have a larger stakes on the ground that the vulture cannot yank out and you will be strapped to the structure. My relationship with Mr. Acosta had lasted long enough for us to catch a vulture. Then my in interest in following him disappeared as mysteriously as it has appeared. 
I never really had the opportunity to thank him for all the things they had taught me. Don Juan said that he had taught me the, the patience of a hunter at the best time to learn it. And above all, he had taught me to draw from solitariness all the comfort that a hunter needs. You cannot confuse solitude with solitariness, Don Juan explained to me. Solitude for, the, for me is psychological of the mind. Solitariness is physical. One is the liberating, the other com comforting. For all this Don Juan had said, I was indeed to Mr. Acosta forever, whether or not I understood indebtedness the way warrior travelers understand it. The second person Don Juan thought I was indebted to was a 10-year-old child i known growing up. His name was Armando Velez. Just like his name, he was extremely dignified, starchy, a little old man. I liked him very much because he was firm and yet very friendly. He was someone who could not easily be intimidated. He would fight anyone if he needed to, and yet it was not bully at all. The two of us used to go on fishing expeditions. We used to catch very small fish that lived under rocks and had to be gathered by hand. We would put the tiny fish we caught to dry in the sun and eat them raw all day sometimes. I also liked the fact that he was very resourceful and clever as well as being ambidextrous. He could throw a rock with his left hand further than his right hand. We had endless com com competitive games in which to my ultimate jargon, he always won. He used to sort of apologize to me for winning by saying, if I slow down and let you win, you'll hate me. It'll be an affront to your name, your manhood, so try harder. Because of his excessively starchy behavior, we used to call him Senor Velez, but the Senor was shortened to show, a custom typical of the region of South America where I came from. One day, Show Velez asked me something quite unusual. He began his request naturally as a challenge to me. I bet anything he said that I know something that you wouldn't dare do. What are you talking about, Show Velez? You wouldn't dare to go down a river in a raft. Oh, yes, I would. I've done it in the flooded river. I got stranded on an island for eight days once. They had to drift food to me. This was the truth. My other best friend was a child nicknamed Crazy Shepherd. We got stranded in a flood on an island once with no way for anyone to rescue us. Townspeople expected the flood to overrun the island and kill us both. They drifted baskets and food down the river in hopes that they would land on the island, which they did. They kept us alive in this fashion until the water had subsided enough for them to reach us with a raft and pull us to the banks of the river. No, this is a different affair, Show Villas continued with his eroded attitude. This one implies going on a raft on a subterranean river. He pointed out that a huge section of a local river went through a mountain that the subterranean section of the river had always been a most intriguing place for me. Its entrance into the mountain was a foreboding cave of considerable size, always filled with bats and smelling of ammonia. Children in the area were told that it was an entrance to hell. Sulfur fumes, heat, stench. You bet your freaking boots, Chauvelez, that I will never go near that river in my lifetime. I said yelling, not in 10 lifetimes. You have to be really crazy to do something like that. Chauvelez's serious face got even more solemn. Oh, he said, then I will have to do it all by myself. I thought for a minute that I could code you into going with me. I was wrong. My loss. Hey, Chauvelez, what's with you? Why in the world would you want to go into the hellish place? I have to, he said in his gruff little voice. You see, my father is as crazy as you are except that he is a father and a husband. He has six children who depend on him. Otherwise, he would be as crazy as a goat. My two sisters, my two brothers, my mother and I depend on him. He is everything to us. I didn't know who Chauvelez's father was. 
I had never seen him before. I didn't know what he did for a living. Show, Show Velez revealed that his father was a businessman and that everything that he owned was on the line, so to speak. My father has constructed a raft and wants to go. He wants to make the expedition. My mother says that he was just letting off some steam, but I don't trust him, Chauvelez continued. I have seen your crazy look in your eyes. One of these days, he'll do it, and I'm sure that he'll die. So I'm going to take his raft and go into that river myself. I know that I will die, but my father won't. I felt something like an electric shock go through my neck. And I heard myself saying in the most aggravated tone one can imagine, I'll do it, Chauvelez, I'll do it. Yes, yes, it'll be great. I'll go with you. Chauvelez had a smirk on his face. I understood it as a smirk of happiness at the fact that I was going with him, not at the fact that he had succeeded in luring me. He expressed that feeling his next sentence. I know that if you are with me, I will survive, he said. I don't care whether Chauvelez survived or not. Whether had galvanized me was his courage. I knew that Chauvelez had the guts to do what he was saying. He and Crazy Shepherd were the only gusty kids in town. They both had something that I considered unique and unheard of. Courage. No one else in the whole town had any. I had tested them all. As far as I was concerned, every one of them was dead, including the love of my life, my grandfather. I knew, with, I knew this without the shadow of a doubt when I was 10. Chauvelez, daring, was a staggering realization for me. I wanted to be him to the bitter end. We made plans to meet at the crack of dawn, which we did, and the two of us carried his father's lightweight raft for three, or four miles out of town into some low green mountains to the entrance of the cave where the river became subterranean. The smell of bat manure was overwhelming. We crawled on the raft and pushed ourselves into the stream. The raft was equipped with flashlights, which we had to turn on immediately. It was pitch black inside the mountain and hum and humid and hot. The water was deep enough for the raft and fast enough that we didn't need to paddle. The flashlights would create grotesque shadows. Chauvelez whispered in my car, in my ear, that perhaps it was better not to look at all. If you have nothing to die for, Don Juan said. Hang on. I thought I skipped a page. If you have nothing to die for, Don Juan said to me once, how can you claim that you have something to live for? The two go hand in hand with death at the helm. The, the third person Don Juan thought I was indebted to beyond my life and my death was my grandmother on my grandmother's side. In my blind affection for my grandfather, the male, I had for forgotten the real source of strength in the household, my very eccentric grandmother. Many years before I came to their household, she had saved a local Indian from being lynched. He was accused of being a sorcerer. Some irate young man was actually hanging him for a tree on my grandmother's property. She came up upon the lynching and stopped it. All the lynchers seemed to have been her godsons and wouldn't dare go against her. She pulled the man down and took him home to cure him. The rope had already cut a deep wound into his neck. His wounds healed, but never left my grandmother's side. He claimed that his life had ended that day of the lynching, and whatever new life he had no longer belonged to him. It belonged to her. Being a man of his word, he dedicated his life to serving my grandmother. He was her valet, major domo, and counselor. My aunts said that it was he who had advised my grandmother to adopt a newborn orphan child as her son something that they resented more than bitterly. When I came into my grandparents' house, my grandmother's adopted son was already in his late thirties. She had sent him to study in France. One afternoon out of the blue, a most elegantly dressed husky man got out of a taxi in front of the house. 
The driver carried his leather suitcase to the patio. The husky man tipped the driver generously. I noticed in one glance that the husky man's features were very striking. He had long curly hair, long curly eyelashes. He was extremely handsome without being physically beautiful. His best features were, however, his beaming open smile, which he immediately turned on me. May I ask your name, young man? He said with the most beautiful stage voice I had ever heard. The fact that he had addressed me as young man had won me over instantly. My name is Carlos Aranaja, sir, I said. And may I ask in turn what yours is? He made a gesture and mock surprise. He opened his eyes wide and jumped backward as if he had been attacked, then began to laugh on uproariously. At the sound of his laughter, my grandmother came out to the patio. When she caught the husky man, she screamed like a little girl and threw her arms around him in the most affectionate embrace. He lifted her up as if she weighed nothing and twirled her around. I noticed then that he was very tall. His huskiness hid his height. He actually had the body of a professional fighter. He seemed to notice that I was eyeing him. He flexed his biceps. I've done some boxing in my day, sir, he said thoroughly and aware of what I was thinking. My grandmother introduced him to me. She said that he was her son, Antoine, her baby, the apple of her eye. She said that he was a dramaticist, a theater director, and a writer, a poet. The fact that he was so athletic was his winning ticket with me. I didn't understand it at first. He was adopted. I noticed, however, that he didn't look at all like the rest of the family. While every one of the members of the family were corpses that walked, he was alive, vital from the inside. We hit it off miraculously. I liked the fact that he worked out every day, punching a bag. I liked immensely that not only did he punch the bag, he kicked it too, in the most astounding style, a mixture of boxing and kicking. His body was as hard as a rock. One day, Antoine confessed to me that his only fervent desire in life was to be a writer of note. I have everything, he said. Life has been very generous to me. The only thing I don't have is the only thing I want, talent. The muses did not like me. I appreciate what I read, but I cannot create anything that I like to read. That's my torment. I lack the discipline or the charm to entice the muses. So my life isn't empty as anything can be. Antoine went on to tell me that the only reality that he had had that he had was his mother. He called his grandmother his bastion, his support, his twin soul. He ended up by voicing a very disturbing thought to me. If I didn't have my mother, he said, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't live. Realize then how profoundly tied he was to my grandmother. All the horror stories that my aunts had told me about the spoiled child Antoine became suddenly very vivid for me. My grandmother had really spoiled him beyond salvation, yet they seemed so very happy together. I saw them sitting for hours on end, his head on her lap, as if he was still a child. I had never heard my grandmother converse with anybody for such lengths of time. Abruptly one day, Antoine started to produce a lot of writing. He began to direct a play at a local theater, a play that he had written himself. When it was staged, it became an instant success. His poems were published in the local newspaper. He seemed to have a hit, a creative streak. But only a few months later, it all came to an end. The editor of the town's paper publicly denounced Antoine. He accused him of plagiarism and published in the paper the proof of Anton's guilt. My grandmother, of course, would not hear of her son's misbehavior. She explained all as a case of profound envy. Every one of those people in that town were envious of the elegance, the style of her son. They were envious of his personality, of his wit. Indeed, he was a personification of elegance and savior fair, but he was a plagiarist for sure. There was no doubt about it. 
and Ta never explained his behavior to anyone. I liked him too much to ask him anything about it. Besides, I didn't care. His reasons were his, were his reasons, and as far as I was concerned. But something was broken from then on. Our lives moved in leaps and bounds, so to speak. Things changed so dramatically in the house from one day to the next that I grew accustomed to expect anything, the best or the worst. One night, my grandmother walked in Anton's room in the most dramatic fashion. There was a look of hardness in her eyes that I have never seen before. Her lips trembled as she spoke. Something terrible has happened, Antoine, she began. Antoine interrupted her. He begged her to let him explain. She cut him off abruptly. No, Antoine, no, she said firmly. This has nothing to do with you. It has, it has to do with me. At this very difficult time for you, something of greater importance yet has happened. Antoine, my dear son, I have run out of time. I want you to understand that this is inevitable, she went on. I have to leave, but you must remain. You are the sum total of everything that I had done in my life, good or bad, Antoine. You are all I am. Give life, uh, give life a try. In the end, we will be together again anyway. Meanwhile, however, do Antoine do whatever. It doesn't really matter what, as long as you do. I saw Anton's body as it shivered with anguish. I saw how he contracted his total being, all the muscles of his body, all his strength. It was as if he had shifted gears from his problems, which was like a river to the ocean. Promise me that you won't die until you die, she shouted at him. And Twine nodded his head. My grandmother the next day, on the advice of her sorcerer counselor, sold her belongings, which were quite sizable, and turned the money over to her son, Antoine. And the following day, every early, very early in the morning, the strangest scene that I had ever witnessed took place in front of my 10-year-old eyes, the moment in which Antoine said goodbye to his mother. It was a scene as unreal as the rest of moving picture. Unreal in the sense that it seemed to have very contorted, written down somewhere, created by a series of adjustments that a writer makes and a director carries out. The patio of my grandparents' house was the setting. Anton was made pro protagonist, his mother the leading actress. Anton was traveling that day. He was going to the port. He saw I was going to catch the Italian liner and go over the Atlantic to Europe on a leisurely cruise. He was as elegantly dressed as ever. A taxi driver was waiting for him outside the house, blowing the horn, his taxi impatiently. I had witnessed Antoine's last feverish night, where he tried as desperately as anyone can try to write a poem about for his mother. It is crap, he said to me. Everything that I write is crap. I'm a nobody. I assured him, even though I was nobody to assure him that whatever he was writing was great. At one moment I got carried away and stepped over certain boundaries I should never have crossed. Take it from me, Antoine, I yelled. I am a worse nobody than you. You have a mother, I have nothing. Whatever you are writing is fine. Very politely, he asked me to leave his room. I had succeeded in making him feel stupid, having to listen to advice from a nobody kid. I bitterly regretted my outburst. I would have liked him to keep on being my friend. Antoine had his elegant overcoat neatly folded draped over his right shoulder. He was wearing a most beautiful green suit, English cashmere. My grandmother spoke. You have to hurry up, dear, she said. Time is of the essence. You have to leave. If you don't, these people will kill you for your money. She was referring to her daughters and their husbands, who were beyond fury when they found out that their mother had quietly disinherited them and that the hideous Antoine, their arch enemy, was going to get away with everything that was rightfully theirs. I'm sorry I have to put you through all of this, my grandmother apologized. But as you know, time is independent of our wishes. Antoine spoke with a grave, beautiful, modulated voice. He sounded more than like more than like a, a stage actor. I'll take it, but a minute. 
Mother, he said, I'll like to read something that I have written for you. It was a poem of thanks. When he had finished reading, he paused. There was a wealth of feeling in the air, such a tremor. It was sheer beauty, Antoine, my grandmother said, citing. It expressed everything that you wanted to say, everything that I wanted to hear. She paused for an instant, then her lips broke into an exquisite smile. Plagiarized, Antoine, she asked. Antoine's smile response to his mother was equally beaming. Of course, mother, he said, of course. They embraced weeping. The horn of the taxi sounded more impatient yet. Antoine looked at me where I was hiding under the stairway. He nodded his head slightly as if to say goodbye. Take care. Then he turned around and walked. And without looking at his mother again, he ran toward the door. He, he was 37 years old, but he looked like he was 60. He seemed to carry such a gigantic weight on his shoulders. He stopped before he reached the door when he heard his mother voicing admonishingly him for the last time. Don't turn around to look, Antoine, he said. Don't turn around to look ever. Be happy and do. Do. There is a trick. Do. The scene filled me with a strange sadness. The last to this day, a most inexplicable melancholy that Don Juan explained as my first acknowledgement that we do run out of time. The next day, my grandmother left with her counselor, manservant, valiant, valet on a journey to a mythical place called Rondonia, where her sorcerer helper was going to elicit her cure. My grandmother was terminally ill, although I didn't know it. She never returned and Don Juan explained the selling of her holdings and giving them to Antoine as a supreme sorcerer's maneuver executed by her counselor to detach her from the care of her family. They were so angry with my mother for her deed that they didn't care whether or not she returned. I had the feeling that they didn't even realize that she had left. On the top of the mountain flat, I recollected the, these three events as if it, they had happened only an instant before. When I expressed my, expressed my thanks to those three persons, I succeeded in bringing them back to the mountaintop. At the end of my shouting, my loneliness was something inexpressible. I was weeping unconditionally. Don Juan very patiently explained to me that loneliness is inadmissible in a warrior. He said the warrior travelers count on being on which they can focus all their love, all their care, this marvelous earth, the mother, the matrix, the epicenter of everything we are and everything we do, the very being to which all of us return, the very being that allows warrior travelers to leave on their definitive journey. That hits home with me. Don Juan proceeded to perform the act of magical intent for my benefit. Laying on his stomach, he executed a series of dazzling movements. He became a blob of luminosity that, that seemed to be swimming as if the ground were a pole. Don Juan said that it was Gennaro's way of hugging the immersed earth and that in spite of the differences in size, the earth acknowledged Gennaro's gesture. The sight of Gennaro's movement of the explanation of them replaced my loneliness with sublime joy. I can't stand the idea that you are leaving Don Juan, I heard myself saying. The sound of my voice and what I had said made me feel embarrassed. When I began to sob involuntarily, Driven by self-pity, I felt more chargon. What is the matter with me, Don Juan, I muttered. I am not ordinar ordinarily like this. What's happening to you is that your awareness is on your toes again, he replied laughing. Then I lost my vestige of control and gave myself fully to feelings of dejection and despair. I'm going to be left alone, I said in a shrieking voice. What's going to happen to me? What's going to become of me? Let's put it it this way, Don Juan said calmly, in order for me to leave the world and face the unknown. I need all my strength, all my forbearance, all my luck, but above all, I need every bit of warrior's traveler's guts of steel. To, remind, to remain behind and fare like a warrior traveler, you need everything of what I myself need. To venture out there the way we are going to is no joking matter but neither it is to stay behind. 
I had an emotional outburst and kissed his hand. Whoa, 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 he said. Next thing you're going to make a shrine for my <laughs> garaches. The anguish that gripped me turned from soul pity to feeling an unequal loss. You are leaving, I muttered, my God, leaving forever. At that moment, Don Juan said something to me that I had done repeatedly since the first day I had met him. His face puffed up as if the deep breath he was taking inflated him. He tapped my back forcefully with the palm of his left hand and said, get up from your toes, lift yourself up. In the next instant, I was once again coherent, complete, in control. I knew that what was expected of me. There was no longer any hesitation on my part or any concern about myself. I didn't care what was going to happen to me when Don Lon left. I knew that his departure was imminent. He looked me, he looked at me, and in that look, his eyes said it all. We will never be together again, he said softly. You don't need my help anymore. I don't want to offer it to you because if you are worthy your salt as a warrior traveler, you'll spit in my eye for offering it to you. Beyond a certain point, the only joy of warrior traveler is aloneness. I wouldn't like you to try to help me either. Once I leave, I'm gone. Don't think about me, for I won't think about you. If you are a worthy warrior traveler, be impeccable. Take care of your world. Honor it. Guard it with your life. He moved away from me. The moment was beyond self-pity or tears or happiness. He shook his head as if to say goodbye or as if he were acknowledged what I felt. Forget the self and you will never fear nothing. In whatever level of awareness you find yourself to be, he said. He had an outburst of levity. He teased me for the last time on the earth, on this earth. I hope you find love, he said. He raised his palm toward me and stretched his fingers like a child, then contracted them against the palm. Chow, he said. I knew that if it was futile to feel sorry or to regret anything, and that what well, it was difficult for me to stay behind, as it was for Don Juan to leave. Both of us were caught in an irreversible energetic maneuver that never, uh, neither of us could stop. Nevertheless, I wanted to join Don Juan, follow him wherever he went. The thought crossed my mind that perhaps if I died, I, he would take me with him. I saw then how Don Juan Matias, the Nigel, led the 15 other seers who were his companions, his wards, his delight one by one to disappear in the haze of that mesa toward the north. I saw how every one of them turned into a blob of luminosity and together they ascended and floated above the mountaintop like a phantom lights in the sky. They circled above the mountain once as Don Juan had said they would. Their last survey, the one for their eyes only, their last look at the marvelous earth and then they vanished. I knew what I had to do. I had run out of time. I took off my top speed toward this precipice and leaped into the abyss. I felt the wind on my face for a moment. And then the most merciful blackness swallowed me like a peaceful subterranean river. The return trip. I was vaguely aware of the loud noises of motor that seemed to be racing in a stationary position. I thought that the attendants were fixing a car in the parking lot at the back of the building where I had my office apartment. The noise became, became so intense that it finally caused me to wake up. I silently cursed the boys who ran the parking lot for fixing their car right under my window. I was hot, sweaty, and tired. I sat up on the edge of my bed, then had the most painful cramps in my calves. I rubbed them for a moment. They seemed to have contracted so tightly that I was afar afraid that I would have horrendous bruises. I automatically headed for the bathroom to look for some ointment, liniment. I couldn't walk. I was dizzy. I fell down, something that had never happened to me before. When I had regained my minimum of control, I noticed that I wasn't worried at all about the cramps in my calves. I had always been a near 
hypochondriac and unusual pain in my calves, such as these, as, is su as such as the one I was having would now be ordinarily have thrown me into a chaotic state of anxiety. I went to the window to close it, although I couldn't hear the noise anymore. I realized that the window was locked and that it was dark outside. It was night. The room was stuffy. I opened the windows. I couldn't understand why I had closed them. The night air was cool and fresh. The parking lot was empty. It occurred to me that the noise must have been made by a car accelerating in the valley between the parking lot and my building. I had thought nothing of it anymore and went to my bed to go back to sleep. I laid a cross in my feet on the floor. I wanted to sleep in this fashion to help the circulation in my calves, which were very sore, but I wasn't sure whether it would have been better to keep them down or perhaps lifting them up on a pillow. As I was beginning to rest comfortably and fall asleep again, I thought came into my mind with such ferocity force that it made me stand up in one single flex. I had jumped into an abyss in Mexico. The next thought that I had was a quasi-logical deduction. Since I had jumped into the abyss deliberately in order to die, I must now be a ghost. How strange I thought that I should return in a ghost-like form to my office apartment on the corner of Westwood and Wilkeshire in Los Angeles after I had died. No wonder my failings were not the same. But if I were a ghost, I responded, why would I have felt the blast of fresh air on my face or the pain in my calves? I touched the sheets of my bed. They felt real to me. So it's metal frame. I went to the bathroom. I looked at myself in the mirror. By the looks of me, I could easily have been a ghost. I looked like hell. My eyes were sunken, my huge black circles under them. I was dehydrated or dead. In an automatic reaction, I drank water straight from the tap. I could actually swallow it. I drank gulp after gulp as if I had no I drunk water for days. I felt my deep inhalations. I was alive. By God, I was alive. I knew it beyond the shadow of a doubt, but I wasn't elated as I should have been. A most unusual thought crossed my mind then. I had died and revived before. I was accustomed to it. It meant nothing to me. The vividness of thought, however, made it into question memory. It was a quasi memory that didn't stem from the situations in which my life had been endangered. It was something quite different from that. It was rather a vague knowledge of something that had never happened and had no reason whatsoever to be in my thoughts. There was no doubt in my mind that I had jumped into an abyss in Mexico. I was now in my apartment in Los Angeles, over 3,000 miles from where I had jumped, with no recollection whatsoever of having made the return trip. In an automatic fashion, I ran the water in the tub and sat in it. I didn't feel the warmth of the water. I was chilled to the bone. Don Juan had taught me that in a moment of crisis, such as this one, one must be used running water as a clean cleansing factor. I remembered this and got under the shower. I let the warm water run over my body, perhaps over an hour. I wanted to think, think calmly and rationally about what was happening to me, but I couldn't. Thoughts seemed to have been erased from my mind. I was thoughtless, yet I was filled to the capacity with sensations that came to my whole body in barrages that I was incapable of examining. All I was about able to do was to feel their onslaughts and let them go through me. The only conscious choice I made was to get dressed and leave. I went to eat breakfast, something I always did at any time of the day, night at the ship's restaurant in Wilkeshire, a block away from my apartment. I'd walked from my office to ship so many times that I knew everything stepped every step of the way. The same walk this time was novelty for me. I didn't feel my steps. It was as if I had a cushion under my feet or as if the sidewalk were carpeted. I practically glided. I was suddenly at the door of the restaurant after that I thought might have been only two or three steps. 
and knew that I could swallow food because I had drunk water in my apartment. I, uh, I also knew that I could talk because I had cleared my throat and cursed while the water ran on me. I walked into the restaurant as I always has done. I sat at the counter and a waitress knew me, came to me. You don't look too good today, dear, she said. Do you have the flu? No, I replied, trying to sound cheerful. I've been working too hard. I've been up for 24 hours straight, writing a paper for a class. By the way, what is what day is today? She looked at her watch and gave me the date, explaining that she had a special watch that was a calendar too, a gift from her daughter. She always gave me the time, 3.15 a.m. I ordered steak and eggs, hash browns, potatoes, and buttered white toast. When she went away to fill my order, another wave of horror flooded my mind. Had it been only an illusion that I had jumped into the abyss in Mexico at twilight the previous day. But even if the jump had been only an illusion, how could I have returned to LA from such a remote place only 10 hours later? I had slept for 10 hours? Or was it that I had taken 10 hours for me to fly, slide, float, or whatever to Los Angeles? To have traveled by conventional means to Los Angeles from the place where I had jumped into the abyss was out of the question, since it would have taken two days just to travel to Mexico City from the place where I had jumped. And as another strange thought emerged in my mind, it had the same clarity of my quasi memory of having died and revived before the same quality of being totally foreign to me. My continuity was now broken beyond repair. I had really died one way or another at the bottom of that gilly. It was impossible to comprehend my being alive, having breakfast at ships. It was impossible for me to look back into my past and see the uninterrupted line of continuous events that all of this, that all of us see when we look into our past. The only explanation available to me was that I followed Don Juan's directives. I had moved my assemblage point to a position that prevented my death. And from my inner silence, I had made that return journey to LA. There was no other rational for me to hold on to. For the first time ever, the line of thought was thought thoroughly acceptable to me and thir thoroughly satisfactory. It didn't really explain anything, but it certainly pointed out a pragmatic procedure that I had tested before in a mild form when I met Don Juan in the town of our choice. And this thought seemed to put all my being at ease. Vivid thoughts began to emerge in my mind. They had the unique quality of clarifying issues. The first one that erupted had to do with something that I had plagued me all along. Don Juan had described it as common occurrence among male sorcerers. My capacity to remember events that had transpired while I was in states of heightened awareness. Don Juan explained heightened awareness as a minute displacement of my assemblage point, which he achieved every time I saw him by actually pushing forcibly on my back. He helped me with such displacements to engage my energy fields that were ordinarily peripheral to my awareness. In other words, the energy fields that were usually on the edge of my assemblage point became central to it during that displacement. A displacement of this nature had two consequences for me, an extraordinary keenness of thought and perception and the incapacity to remember once I was back in my normal state of awareness while what had transpired while I had been in that other state. My relationship with my cohorts had been an example of both of these consequences. I had cohorts, Don Juan's other apprentices, companions for my, definite, my definitive journey. I interacted with them only in heightened awareness. The clarity and scope of our interaction was supreme. The drawback for me was that in my daily life, there were only poignant quasi memories that drove me to desperation with anxiety and expectations. 
I could say that I lived my normal life on the, on the perennial lookout for somebody who was going to appear all of a sudden in front of me, perhaps emerging from an office building, perhaps turning a corner and bumping into me. Wherever I went, my eyes darted everywhere, ceaselessly and involuntarily looking for people who didn't exist and yet existed like no one else. While I sat at ships that morning, everything that had happened to me in heightened awareness to the most minute detail in all the years with Don Juan began again, a continuous memory without interruption. Don Juan had laminated that a male sorcerer who is inaugural performance per force had to be fragmented because of the bulk of his energetic mass. He said that each fragment lived a specific range of total scope of activity and the events that he experienced in each fragment had to be joined every day to give a complete conscious picture of everything that had taken place in his total life. Looking into my eyes, he had told me that the unification takes years to accomplish and that he had been told of cases of nagrals who could never reach the total scope of their activities in a conscious manner and live fragmented. What I experienced that morning at ships was beyond anything I could have imagined in my wildest fantasies. Don Juan had said to me that time after time that the world of sorcerers was not an immutable world where the word is final, unchanging, but that it's a world of eternal fluctuation where nothing should be taken for granted. The jump into the abyss had mo modified my cognition so, so drastically that allowed now the entrance of possibilities, both potentious and indescribable. But anything that I could have said about unification of my cognition fragments would have paled in comparison to the reality of it. The fateful morning at ships, I experienced something indefinitely more potent than I did the day that I saw energy as flows in the universe for the first time. The day that I ended up in the bed of my office apartment after having been on the campus of UCLA without actually going home in the fashion my cognitive system demanded in order for the whole event to be real. In ships, I integrated all the fragments of my being. I had acted in each one of them with perfect certainty and consistency. And yet I had no idea that I had done that. I was in essence a gigantic puzzle and to fit each piece of the puzzle into place produced an effect that had no name. I sat at the counter of ships, perspiring, profusely pondering, uselessly and obsessively questioning that I couldn't be answered. How could all this be possible? How could I have been fragmented in such a fashion? Who are we really? Certainly not the people all of us have been led to believe we are. I had memories of events that have never happened as far as some core of my, myself was concerned. I couldn't even weep. A sorcerer weeps when he is fragmented, Don Juan had said uh, to me once. When he's complete, he is taken by a shiver that has the potential because it is so intense of ending his life. I, I was experiencing such a shiver. I doubted that I could ever meet my cohorts again. It appeared to me that all of them had left with Don Juan. I was alone. I wanted to think about it, to mourn my loss, to plunge into a satisfying sadness the way I had always done. I couldn't. There was nothing to mourn, nothing to feel sad about. Nothing mattered. All of us were warrior travelers and all of us had been swallowed by infinity. All along, I had listened to Don Juan talk about the warrior traveler. I had liked the description immensely and I had identified with it on a purely emotional basis. Yet I had never felt what he really meant by that, regardless of how many times he had explained his meaning to me. That night at the counter of ships, I knew 
uh, what Don Juan had been talking about. I was a warrior traveler. Only energetic facts were meaningful for me. All the rest were trimmings that had no importance at all. That night, while I sat waiting for my food, another vivid thought erupted in my mind. I felt a wave of empathy, a wave of identification with Don Juan's premises. I had finally reached the goal of his teachings. I was one with him as I had never been before. It had never been the case that I was just fighting Don Juan or his concepts, which were revolutionary for me because he didn't fulfill the linearity of my thoughts as a Western man. Rather, it was that Don Juan's precision in presenting his concepts had always scared me half to death. His efficiency had appeared to be dogmatic. It was that appearance that had forced me to seek eludications and had me made, had made me act all along as if I had been a reluctant believer. Yes, I had jumped into the abyss, I said to myself, and I didn't die because before I reached the bottom of the gully, I let the dark sea of awareness swallow me. I surrendered to it without fears or regrets, and the sea had supplied me with whatever was necessary for me not to die, but to end up in my bed in LA. This explanation would have been explained nothing to me two days before. At three in the morning, in ships, it meant everything to me. I banged my hand on the table as if I were alone in the room. People looked at me and smiled knowingly. I didn't care. My mind was focused on an insoluble dilemma. I was alive despite the fact that I had jumped into an abyss in order to die 10 hours before. I knew that such a dilemma could never be resolved. My normal cognition required a linear explanation in order to be satisfied. And the linear explanations were not possible. That was the crux of the interruption of continuity. Don Juan had said that the interruption was sorcery. I knew this now as clearly as I was capable of. How right Don Juan had been when he had said that in order for me to stay behind, I needed all my strength, all my forbearance, and above all, a warrior travels gut of steel. I wanted to think about Don Juan, but I couldn't. Besides, I didn't care about Don Juan. There seemed to be a giant barrier between us. I truly believed at that moment that the foreign thought that had been ins insuating itself to me since I had woke up was true. I was someone else. An exchange had taken place at the moment of my jump. Otherwise, I would have relished the thought of Don Juan. I would have belonged to him, for him. I would have felt a twinge of resentment because he had take, he had he had it taken me with him. That would have been my normal self. Truth, I truthfully wasn't the same. This thought gained momentum until it invaded all my being. Any residue of my old self that I made have retained vanished then. A new mood took over. I was alone. Don Juan had left me inside a dream at his agent, agent provocateur. I felt my body begin to lose its rigidity. It became flexible. My degrees until I could breathe deeply and freely. I laughed out loud. I didn't care that people were staring at me and weren't smiling this time. I was alone and there was nothing I could do, nothing I could have done about it. I had the physical sensation of actually entering into a passageway, a passageway that had a force of its own. It pulled me in. It was a silent passageway. Don Juan was the passage, quiet and immense. This was the first time ever that I felt that Don Juan was void of physicality. There was no room for sentimentality or longing. I couldn't possibly have missed him because he was there as depersonalized emotion that lured me in. The passageway challenged me. I had a sensation of exuberance, ease. Yes, I could travel the passageway alone or in company perhaps forever. 
And to do this was not an imposition for me, nor was it a pleasure. It was more than the being of the de definite, definitive journey, the unavoidable fate of a warrior traveler. It was the beginning of a new era. I should have been weeping with the realization that I have found that passageway, but I wasn't. I was facing infinity at ships. How extraordinary. I felt a chill on my back. I heard Don Juan's voice saying that the universe was indeed unfathomable. At that moment, the back door of the restaurant, the one that had led to the parking lot, opened and a strange character entered. A man, perhaps in his early 40s, disheveled and emancipated, but was rather handsome features. I had seen him for years roaming around UCLA, mingling with the students. Someone had told me that he was an outpatient of a nearby veterans hospital. He seemed to be mentally unbalanced. I had seen him time after time at ships, huddled over a cup of coffee, always at the same end of the counter. I had also seen how he waited outside, looking through the window, watching for his favorite stool to become vacant if someone was sitting there. When he entered the restaurant, he sat at his usual place and then he looked at me, our eyes met. The next thing I knew, he had let out a formidable scream that chilled me and everyone present to the bone. Everyone looked at me wide-eyed, some at them with unchewed food in their mouths. Obviously, they thought I had screamed. I had set up the presidents by banging the counter and laughing out loud. The man jumped off his stool and ran out of the restaurant, tur turning back to the stare at me while, with his hands, he made agitated gestures over his head. I succumbed to an impulsive urge and ran after the man. I wanted him to tell me what he had seen in me and that he had made him scream. I overtook him in the parking lot and asked him to tell me what he had screamed. He covered his eyes and screamed again, even louder. He was, a ch he was like a child frightened by a nightmare, screaming at the top of his lungs. I lift him and went back to the restaurant. What happened to you, dear? The waitress asked with a concerned look. I thought you ran out on me. I just want to see a friend, I said. The waitress looked at me and made a gesture of mockery, annoyance, and surprise. Is that guy your friend, she asked. The only friend I have in the world, I said, and that was the truth. If I could define friend as anyone who sees through the veneer that covers you and knows where you really come from. That's the end of this amazing travel journey through the dark night of the soul, infinity, mud shadows, amazing awareness of Carlos Castaneda. I hope you enjoyed this book as much as I have. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, Please don't forget to hit the like, share, and subscribe button. If you can help me out, that'd be amazing. I hope this book has taught everybody the journey that one has to go through in order to emerge into your new self, the one that you didn't know that existed. Going back and revisiting and healing things that made you the human that you are today. We go through a lot and each of us have individualized stories and traumas and experiences and stories that shape us to the humans that we are today and sometimes we forget moments in our lives that have changed us and molded us and this story brings us to those points of deep thinking critical thinking and looking at all the people that have shaped us into what we are as we are listening to this. There's a lot of profoundness that this book has given me and a lot that I resonate with. As we all seek infinity ourselves and the awareness of consciousness, 
it's a really good guide and one that I hope that you can buy the book and read it for yourselves and feel the same way that I do. With that, sending each and every one of you love and light. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Keep those vibes high. Reach for the stars. And I'll see you on the next one. Bye.